Well, my name is Todd Malone. It is wonderful to be back here at FBC. Ann and I had a great time in Oregon. We spent time on the coast and saw ocean and waves. We spent time in the mountains and saw snow and trees. Um, just had a wonderful time connecting with, with friends, people who have been mentors to me, um, people who have been an important part of my life. If you're looking around and you're noticing Ann is not here, it's not because we left her in Oregon. Um, she is taking care of a sick grandbaby, so um, that's where she is. For all of the joy and fun of being in Oregon, last Sunday I sat in church, actually my home church that um, I used to be a youth pastor at, that I kind of grew up in, um, was just having a delightful time seeing people I've known for 30 plus years, and um, and also stood there loving it and missing FBC. Um, there is truth to what Paul has told us in the book of Ephesians. God unites us together as a people, as a church. And when, they, when you are with people whom you do life with, um, there's just no replacement for it. Okay, important question. Who here has seen Star Wars, Rise of Skywalker? Okay, um, who here has not seen it? <laughs> Don't worry, I'm not gonna spoil anything major. Um, for those who are not familiar with Star Wars, let me summarize it for you. There are good guys. There are bad guys. They are at war with one another in space. <laughs> the Star Wars. Here's basically how things go through the Star Wars series of movies. The good guys win battles. They accomplish things. They'll destroy major weapons. They will foil plans. They will even kill leaders. But the bad guys keep coming. They are relentless. It doesn't matter, it seems, the damage that the good guys inflict on the bad guys, they keep coming. And in this final movie in the series, so they say, <laughs> turns out they made a lot of money in this movie, so it probably won't be. Um, in this final movie in the series, there is a big reveal that explains why the enemy keeps coming. Now, it's not that big of a reveal because they show it in half the trailers. Um, but there is, it turns out, this unexpected but incredibly powerful, evil presence that is operating behind the scenes and has been operating behind the scenes through this whole series. And in this final movie, you, you see who this is and the good guys finally confront him. As we come to the closing part of Ephesians, Paul is actually doing something very similar here. Now, let's remember what we have seen as we've gone through Ephesians. Ephesians is divided into two halves. In the first half, the focus is on what God has done for the Ephesians. And it talks about that God has blessed them with every spiritual blessing. And he has taken people who were far off, people who were distant, and he has brought them near. He has taken people who are dead in their sins. 
and he's made them alive and he has brought them into one people who are to be united. And then in the second half of the book, it focuses on what the Ephesians are to do. And what they are fundamentally to do is to maintain the unity that God has given them. And by maintaining the unity that God has given them, that is how the world will look at the church and will know that God is alive, Christ is real, and Christ is doing his work in the world. The last couple of weeks, we have seen that Paul even drills down to the level of the household. How do we maintain unity within even the household? And as we wrap up this week, what Paul is going to do is he's going to confront us with the reality that fulfilling the assignments that have been given in Ephesians is incredibly challenging. It is more challenging than we ever give it credit for. And that is because there is an enemy working behind the scenes that we tend to ignore. And what Paul is going to do is he's going to close by showing this enemy and telling us what to do about it. And what we are to do is allow the Lord to strengthen us. And then Paul is going to tell us why we have to have the Lord strengthen us. And then he's going to end with one of the most famous passages in the Bible, which really is an explanation of how the Lord strengthens us. So we start in verse 10 with an exhortation. And the exhortation is right here in this word, be strong in the Lord. Now, the way that it's written in your handout is is that we need to allow or let the Lord strengthen you. And the reason for that is because of the Greek words behind what's written as be strong. It's really the idea of allow the Lord to strengthen you. You don't make yourself strong. It's the Lord who makes you strong and you must give room. You must allow the Lord to strengthen you. Not with your own strength, but with his might, his power, the power that comes from him. That's the exhortation that governs this entire passage. That's the exhortation that summarizes this entire book. Be strong. Allow the Lord to strengthen you with his power, his strength. The reason for that, the goal for that, is that you may be able to stand When you think of this word stand, it's easy to think of of planting your feet. And I am not going to be moved. I'm not going to be knocked over. I'm not going to be knocked back. That's not bad, but that actually doesn't go far enough in understanding this word that Paul is using here. Think instead in terms of standing against racism. Standing against injustice. Standing against abortion. When we take a stand against something like abortion, we don't just plant our feet and we say, no one's going to make me have an abortion. Well, that's good. But that's not really what we mean by that. We mean that we are going to move forward. We are going to engage. We are going to speak out about what is right, what is true. We are going to, in a sense, take back some of the enemy's territory. That's what Paul means here. That we may be able to stand. That we may be able to to step forward against what the enemy is doing. And you know that this is the central goal because this word stand or some form of it is going to be used four times in the next four verses. It is consistently what Paul is wanting us to do. I mentioned that I had a um, really good time in Oregon, a great time at my church last Sunday. But one of the, um, one of the unfortunate things that happened in church on Sunday is that I was convicted. Um, sitting there listening to this pastor, someone I've known for a long time, I, Ann and I actually knew him in Texas before he took the job as being the senior pastor in my home church in Oregon. 
that was pretty cool. Um, and as he's preaching, I found myself convicted of how incredibly self-focused I am, but especially in the sense of being very self-protective. Right, It's easy for me to be defensive, or it's easy for me to point out someone's faults in order to build me up. And as I was sitting there feeling convicted about this, I've got a choice. What am I going to do about it? But what I know, because I've struggled with this long enough, is what I can't do is just grit my teeth, say, I'm going to try hard to not be a self-focused self-protective person. It is too hardwired into me. It's a habit of relating to people that is grounded deep within me. It's, it's a habit of my soul. And so when I read Paul's exhortation in these verses to stand against the schemes of the devil, to stand against evil, to stand against sin, it sounds impossible to me. I can't get a handle on these things. I keep struggling again and again and again and again. Just ask you, no show of hands, but um, can you relate to that? Do you have a way of thinking, way of relating, attitudes, behaviors? that you fight, but they are so deeply rooted that they affect your relationships with people. They affect how you view yourself. They affect how you see God. And it's like the bad guys in Star Wars. They just keep coming. The book of Ephesians has called us to live in the love and blessing we have received from the Lord and in unity with one another. And if we are honest with one another, that's those sins that keep haunting us, that keep attacking us, that keep, that keep binding us are sins that ultimately drive us into ourselves and away from one another and undermine our ability to experience God's love and blessing in powerful ways and definitely undermine our unity with one another. The reason that Paul is going to say that we cannot win these battles on our own is because there is powerful opposition that stands against us, that goes far deeper and is far stronger than we ever imagine. And that's what we see in verses 11 and 12. Put on the whole armor of God. Why? Because of the schemes of the devil. The devil makes plans against us. And then he gives in verse 12 a whole bunch of titles. What is he talking about here? This is actually terminology that both Jews and Gentiles at that time would have recognized as talking about evil spirits or demonic forces. They would have understood what Paul is saying here. And he kind of gives us catch all at the end. When he talks about the spiritual forces of evil, it's these are spiritual realities that are aligned against God's people. So do you see the picture that Paul is painting here? Satan is intelligent. He plans. He schemes against God's people. There is an organized structure that is involved in carrying out those plans. And the reason that we must make room for the Lord to strengthen us is because we are no match on our own for that opposition. There is a movie that I recommend you not see unless you can find a TV version of it to remove all of these swear words. And then it might be a silent film, I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> but there is one line in that movie that doesn't have a swear word in it, um, and is a fantastic statement. Verbal Kent is played by Kevin Spacey, and he makes this statement at the end of the movie. 
the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world that he didn't exist. Let me tell you my struggle, my fear. So the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the church that he didn't exist. I am concerned that we as a church do not take seriously the truth of these verses. We live day to day like this isn't true. We live day to day like our struggle is really just against our own flesh and blood. Like the people who pose us or hurt us are the real enemy. And they are not. They are also victims of the enemy. We live as if our own struggles to stand against sin and evil go no deeper than the flesh and blood that we struggle with. But what Paul is saying is there is something that is even deeper than flesh and blood that is at work in our lives. And let me show you how this works in my own struggle. Someone criticizes me. There are options for how I can respond. Right? If the person is not a linebacker, I can slug them. All the way to praying for them. Huge range of options. What does Satan do? Satan kind of focuses me on, here, let me present you with a series of options that I think are good. It could be defensive. You can insult them. You could cut them down. All these options that are ungodly. Satan will limit what are my choices for what I think are realistic. What do you mean forgive that person? You can't do that. It's not right what they did to you. What do you mean turn the other cheek? This person needs to be taught a lesson for their spiritual growth. Satan narrows that list of options. And then Satan, from that narrow list of options, says, what you really want, what you really desire more than anything else, deep in your soul, is that people not think badly of you, that you look good, that people admire you. And so with that motivation, I respond in defensiveness. With that motivation, I might cut the other person down behind their back. And then I feel guilt and shame. And Satan steps in yet again and says, look at you, you failure of a Christian. And he accuses. If people only knew what went on in your heart and your mind, they would never allow you to be their pastor. That is what Satan does. If I think that my struggle is just against flesh and blood, you know what? Then I think this person is my enemy. If I think that my struggle is just against flesh and blood, then I think that the solution all along is I just need to grit my teeth and try harder. And I beat myself up when I don't, which just reinforces that cycle again and again and again. And Paul reminds us that we cannot make the mistake of thinking that the devil does not exist. If we do, we set ourselves up for failure. We will not stand firm. We must give the Lord room to strengthen us with his might. The reason we have powerful opposition that Satan brings against us. So how do we give the Lord room to strengthen us? It's through the empowering gifts that he give us, gives us, which are called the armor of God in verses 13 through 20. Verses 13 introduces us again that we must take up the whole armor of God. 
We must allow the Lord to strengthen us by taking up all of the armor, not just part of it. And this is what will allow us to withstand same word or same similar word and to stand firm. Taking up or putting on the armor means growing deeper in a knowledge of what God gives us and cultivating a life that depends on God's power. And we stand firm by putting on that armor. Now, when I was a kid, um, about once a year, I'd get a Sunday school handout that looks something like that. Does that look familiar to you at all? This is actually a lot cooler than the ones that I got as a kid. Um, But the problem was when I was a kid, what I focused on was how cool I am in the armor um, as God's great warrior. And it's nothing wrong with the picture. I think these pictures are great. And then as I got older, I made a different mistake. I spent a lot of time trying to decipher all the nuances of the symbolism. What is it? belt and how does that work and what's the, what's a belt telling us about about what we're supposed to do and be and, and what is a shield and how does that work and talk to me about shoes let's learn about shoes and helmets and certainly the sword that's the best part um, and so you just spend a lot of time talking about the symbolism that's what I did but you know the mistake I made in both cases you know what I didn't talk about the virtues that Paul is trying to get across to us that we must actually adopt and take on. And for that reason, that's what I'm going to focus on as we go through the rest of this passage. Not going to spend a lot of time talking about swords and shields and boots and things like that. I want to talk about the virtues and the practices that we can have to help build those virtues into our lives. We start with fastening the belt of truth. Truth, when we speak of that, is the idea of of speaking and living what is accurate, what is right. And that covers a lot of ground. We must speak without spin. If you've watched any of the impeachment trial that's going on right now, both sides are saying the exact same thing. Both sides are saying, you're leaving a lot out, you're putting a lot in that's not true. May that never be said of us. May that never be true of us, whether it's said of us or not. May that never be true of us. We must speak and live the truth And that includes speaking to one another and living the truth that Paul keeps emphasizing in Ephesians. We are loved and blessed by Christ, and we are one united body. What is something we can do? What's a practice we can adopt that would help us be people who live the truth? We need to catch ourselves and correct ourselves when we are not giving an accurate picture. When we realize, and I do this all the time, that I'm falling into a trap of of maybe saying something in a way that's making me look a little bit better than it should. I need to catch myself and say, no, actually, a, a better way of describing it is, and then being accurate. The second thing we are to do is to put on the breastplate of righteousness. Righteousness is when our lifestyle reflects the truth that we believe. You see, when Jesus was confronted with an opportunity to do what was right, he did what was right. When Jesus was confronted with an opportunity to do what was wrong, he did not take that opportunity. That's what righteousness looks like. That is a righteous character in action. So what do we do in our lives that help us build that righteousness into our lives? It's the very thing that Jesus calls us to do throughout the Gospels. Repent, believe, follow him. Repent, believe, follow Jesus. We find ourselves living unrighteously in an area and we declare out loud, we declare to the Lord that this is not how we want to live and what we want to be. 
And we want to change directions, and we will change directions. We believe that we are forgiven. We believe that the Holy Spirit does empower us to change directions. And then we follow Jesus. We live like him. That pattern, repent, believe, follow Jesus, is the daily, hourly pattern of the Christian life. And that is how we grow in righteousness. We are to be ready because of the gospel of peace. That means we must be prepared to share the gospel, which contains the message of the peace that we have with God because of Christ. The message of the gospel is this. We were created to live in peace with God, but we rebelled against God. That is called sin. And that rebellion made us God's enemies. But God so desired peace with us. He loved us so much that he sent Jesus to live a perfect life. The life that it looks like to live in peace with God. He died on the cross to take all of the penalty for all of our rebellion against God. And he was raised three days later. And because he was raised three days later, that same power that raised him works in us and allows us to live as people in peace with God. That is the gospel and the practice that we need to be ready for the gospel of peace or because of the gospel of peace is this. The truths that I just recited, we need to revisit them constantly in our lives. You never, ever outgrow the gospel. You are never too spiritually mature for the gospel. You must keep coming back to the gospel again and again. It is the very lifeblood of our walk with the Lord. It is the lifeblood of this church. We must constantly revisit the gospel in our lives. And we must boldly proclaim the truths of the gospel. Shield of faith. Faith is our confidence in God's love and his character for us. It is the confidence that nothing comes into our lives that is beyond God's love for us and his ability to make us like Christ. Satan's flaming darts or flaming arrows, depending on your translation, refers to all the different ways that Satan attacks us. The ways that, that he infiltrates our thinking and our values. The way that he shifts our focus and our desires away from what is righteous. What practice can we have that reinforces faith in our lives? I would encourage you as you face temptation, as you face things that stress you, as you face tragedies, that you meet them with a declaration. And it's not a bad idea to say it out loud. I know what I'm facing is terrifying. But I know, I know God loves me and he wants my good. And as we say that out loud in the face of whatever we are confronted with, the Lord takes that and more deeply drives home the strength that comes from faith in him. We must take up the helmet of salvation. If faith is our, is our confidence in God's character and love, salvation is our confidence in God's deliverance, both in eternity, but don't forget also for today. You see, the fundamental assignment that we have in life today is not to prove to God that he should love us. It's not to earn God's love. It's to live in it. The way Jesus said, the way Jesus put it was, abide in me. That always, for every situation, is our assignment. And that is possible only because of our salvation. That is what we must remember. 
So how do we do that? We need to pay attention daily to how you are knowing the Lord better. What are the signs that you are at peace with God and that he is at peace with you? Because you have those signs in your life every single day. Whether it's just the beauty of creation, favor with a friend, or just the chance to hear God's word. And that takes us to the last of the pieces of armor, the word of God. And that refers to the Bible. Now, as you know, and as I love to think about as a kid, a sword is both an offensive and defensive weapon. And really so is the word of God. We take up the, word, the sword of the spirit. We take up God's word when we are attacked by temptation or confusion or distress. And we turn to God's word and we say, what is right and true in this situation based on what God has said? As we encounter evil and injustice and suffering around us, we take up God's word and we say, what is it supposed to look like and what is my role in bringing what is right and good and just? We must take in God's word and we must share God's word. The armor of the Lord. What it means to stand is to grow in our knowledge of who we are and who God is, to live a holy life, including speaking and living the truth, to have confidence in God's love and character, to daily know the Lord better, and to be people who learn and speak God's word. That is what someone looks like who has put on the whole armor of God. That is what it means to make room for the Lord to strengthen us as we put in practice each of these practices that those virtues may grow in us. But that's not where the passage ends. See, at the heart of spiritual warfare is prayer. Paul doesn't present this as an additional piece of armor. It's the foundation to all the other pieces of armor. We are to pray in the spirit, which means we are to pray led by the spirit, guided by him and helped by him constantly as we pray. We need to pray with prayer and supplication. Supplication means an urgent request to meet a need. And remember what Paul is talking about in the context of these verses. He's talking about putting on the armor of God. That is the urgent need that we have, that we should pray for ourselves and for one another, that we would be people who wear the whole armor of God. And that's really what Paul is modeling for us in these last verses. He is asking that he would be ready, that he would be bold to be able to declare the gospel of peace. He has picked one of the pieces of armor and said, pray for me. Let's go back to the chart. How does the armor of God work in our lives? Well, we have an event. Maybe it's criticism. Maybe it's something that pops up on the computer that tempts us. We've got a whole range of options for how we can respond But if we are people of truth and of God's word, then God uses that to define what are good and right and appropriate options for us. Those options have to be narrowed. If we are people who are growing in righteousness and are committed to abiding with Christ because that's what it means to live in our salvation, then God narrows our options and he assures us that the options that he calls us to are possible. The more I understand the salvation that God has brought us, what it cost him to send his son, to have his son die on the cross, the more that I have confidence in God's love and character, my faith grows, my understanding of the gospel grows, and as a result, my desire for Christ and to be like him grows. And that leads to my response. And my response will be dictated by God's word. If I'm a person 
committed to his word. God shows me how to respond and he empowers me to do it. And as I have seen God work through this entire process and seen him work in my life, I praise him and I become prepared to share the gospel of peace with others. Here's the other thing to remember. If somewhere along the way I wandered off, I come back to the gospel of peace and I'm reminded that my salvation is based in the Lord and I trust his deliverance. God saves me, delivers me when I sin and I repent, believe, follow him and we start again. And of course, underneath all of that, Supporting all of that, empowering all of that is prayer. That is what the armor of God is all about. It's not just about putting on armor that looks impressive and makes us feel like we are mighty warriors. It is about making room for the Lord to strengthen us. The entire book of Ephesians is a call to stand in unity with one another and in our identity as God's people. The way that we stand in unity with one another and in our identity as God's people is to make room for the Lord to strengthen us. We must rely on his strength because the opposition against us is stronger than we are. We must make room for the Lord's strength through prayer and the practice of putting on the armor of God. That is Paul's point as he closes the book of Ephesians. Make room for God to empower you. In Star Wars, the good guys have to go to the enemy territory to defeat him. And that is where Star Wars and our story parts ways. See, our enemy has already been defeated. He's powerful. He is powerful. And he brings damage. But he is not all powerful. He is not more powerful than the God who wants to empower you. That is the point of the the armor of God. So how do we respond? Some suggestions. Rewrite verses 10 through 20 in your own words. If you want to do the last four, that's fine too. Those are good verses. But the focus is really on verses 10 through 20. Share with someone. Just like Paul did. Paul said, here's a part of the armor that I need to put on. Share with someone. Just like Paul did. How can they pray for you? How can they support you? What is the part of armor that you need to grow in this week? Get support in that then you take up the process of prayer. Just as Paul told us to do, pray for the Lord to strengthen you, especially in that part of the armor that you're trying to put on. And then, wow, if I could give any discipline to us, any practice to us, that would help us very, very practically on a daily basis, is if you took five minutes out of the middle of your day and just reflected how Is God working to grow me in that part of the armor? Pay attention to what God is doing in your life. He is going to answer that prayer. Take time in the middle of your day, every day, to see what God is doing. There are three groups of people who are sitting here today. There are people who come into a place like this Maybe you didn't grow up in church. They don't know anything about Christ. They don't know much about church. And they hear a passage like this, and they find that their hearts are drawn to a God who empowers them to live the kind of lives that they want to live. And if that is you, there is a next step for you. The next step is to talk to me or talk to someone who's going to be up front here at the end of the service. 
There's a group of people here who, who maybe have, they know Christ, but they're new in their faith, and, and they just are constantly getting beaten up by the sin that surrounds them and is in them and by the, the brokenness of a fallen world. And they're desperate for where do I go next? What do I do to grow in these areas of my life? A good next step for you is again to either talk to one of us up here or really either one of you in that first two groups. In the bulletin you had, there's a place you can tear off how you want to respond. Just write on there. I want to know Christ or I want help putting on the armor of God. Slip it in one of the boxes that's in the foyer and we will get you help. And you know what? There's a whole bunch of people in this room who have been Christians for a long time. They have lived through being beaten up. They have lived through the struggles with sin and they have seen over and over again that God is faithful and God delivers. And you are people, even though you are still struggling, I know it, I am. But you are the people that those first two groups desperately need to speak into their lives and say, I know what it's like. And I will walk with you as we discover that God is faithful. If you want to be someone who speaks into someone's life, let one of us know. Put it on the response card. I want to close by having us stand and pray. You cannot read the book of Ephesians. You cannot read this passage and not fall on your knees before the Lord in prayer. But I'm making you stand. <sighs> Heavenly Father, we are blown away by what you have given us and revealed that you have given us in the book of Ephesians. Lord, you promise that you bless us with every spiritual blessing. That we are loved unfailingly by you. And Lord, the gift that I think we most take for granted and maybe even sometimes disregard is that you have united us as a people. You have brought us together as a community. Lord, we ask that you would strengthen us with your power. Lord, that we may live in light of your blessing, in light of your love, and in light of the unity that you have created. Lord, we pray that we would make room by doing the practices that we've talked about and putting on the armor of God, and that we would be diligent in praying for your strength. And Lord, may we be people who support one another in this very process. We come before you because this passage has made clear that we on our own cannot do any of these things. The power against us is too strong. So we come to you and we ask you for your strength. And we thank you that you give it. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. We have folks who are here to pray with you, whatever you need to pray for. If there are others on the prayer team, you can come forward. Let me leave you with this thought. This is what Paul has told us today about who God is. Paul has said God is the type of God who equips us and empowers us to stand against what opposes us and what seeks to bring us down spiritually. So our challenge is to leave here and through prayer and practice, put on all of God's armor. You are dismissed.